A while ago, I asked a German combat engineer serving in Ukraine if he had experienced electronic warfare at the front line, and he noted, Yes, I have. It ranges from failing of radios and cell phones as far as the drones just crash. To get a better understanding of how electronic warfare works in real life, since it's quite a nebulous concept to me, I asked an expert about some real life scenarios. How to deal with anti-radiation missiles, that home in on radars and similar equipment, and what to do about being jammed. So I talked with the writer and analyst Thomas Willington, and if you want to know more, check out the links in the description. Like Tom's article on a theoretical framework for electronic maneuver in the Defense Horizon Journal. So electronic warfare, we talked a bit about it already, and it's, it's, for me it's quite a nebulous concept. So it, it, you work in the electronic spectrum and everything, and yes, there's radar, and there's radio, and there's cell phones. But for, to make it more concrete, what are basic operations that electronic warfare performs? So like a, a real-life example on the battlefield or, or even outside the battlefield. How would it look like? Okay. Um... The first challenge with electronic warfare, as you, as you just mentioned, is we can't see it. So we're um, fighting, or the military are fighting in an environment which humans have no ability to sense. We can't taste it, smell it, see it. Um, and what you're doing in electronic warfare effectively is you are trying to frustrate the enemy's use of the electromagnetic spectrum. And they're using the electromagnetic spectrum primarily for radio communications and for radar. And uh, radar is a form of radio technology, effectively. You're using radio waves to detect an object and track it. So to give you an example, real-world example, of how you would use or how electronic warfare is used at the combat level, um, let's consider that you're flying along in a fast jet um, and let's suppose that that fast jet is a lovely German Air Force F4 Phantom, which I'm a huge fan of. And uh, you're, you're zooming along quite happily and you're flying close to the inner German border during the Cold War. And you have a um, Soviet Army air defense radar that detects you and starts to track you. Now, you know you've been detected because you've got sensors on your aircraft, air, um, antennas in fact, which when they detect a radio signal on a certain frequency, they realize, okay, that radio signal is associated with a particular type of radar. Let's say it's an air defense radar. It sounds an alarm and it alerts the pilot that this radar is transmitting, so it's tracking you. Um, these sensors got, known as radar warning receivers, got more and more sophisticated as the Cold War unfolded and to be able to actually pinpoint where that radar is located relative to your own position. And also, what is the radar actually doing? Is it just tracking you or has it, is it tracking you in a particular way that it's got a lock so that it can guide a surface-to-air missile towards you, which is obviously a very serious situation if you're a pilot. So you're flying along, this alarm goes, you realize there's this Russian radar that's tracking you, it tells you whereabouts it is. And what you might do is you might try to break the tracking of that radar. Now, how you can do that is you can use a technology called chaff. And chaff was invented in the Second World War, but it, it's still in use today. And the chaff is basically thousands of, of small metallic fibers they look a bit like the tinsel that you get on the christmas tree um, at christmas time and as they're metallic they go into the atmosphere and the radar signal hits those little filaments that you've now ejected from the aircraft and the long and short of it is that causes a huge amount of interference to appear on the radar screen of the person tracking you so suddenly they're not able to tell where your aircraft is um, amidst all of this interference that they're now seeing on their radar screen. So if you like it, it's like a form of camouflage almost. It's like electromagnetic camouflage. Or if you think about it in the land warfare domain, when armored vehicles um, send smoke out and so that they can maneuver behind the smoke and get out of danger, it's the same thing. So you might use this technology called chaff, or you might try and jam the radar. And what you might do by doing that is having 
your own transmitter in the aircraft, which then transmits a very powerful radio signal uh, into the radar that is tracking you, creating interference, creating a lot of noise and, and preventing that radar being able to tell where you are and what you're doing, how fast you're flying and all of that. And how that works is a bit like, I, I often use the analogy of a, of, a, of a rock concert. Okay, so if you imagine you go to a rock concert and um, you're sitting in the audience and before the band comes on that you, you've gone to go and see, you've got a person who's just standing playing the violin and they're playing it beautifully and you're listening and it's, it's, it's absolutely lovely. Um, and then halfway through the song, the rock band comes on stage and starts to play and you, you really hear them, you know, bang, music comes out and the violinist carries on. Now, the violinist is still playing. Their sound still exists but you can no longer hear them because the rock band is so much louder. And that's exactly how it works with jamming. You're putting in a much stronger signal than the radar's getting back um, from uh, the, the, radar, the radio signals that are being bounced off the aircraft, and that prevents the radar from tracking you. So that's a sort of real-world example of how electronic warfare would work. Um, do you also have an example for like um, regular ground combat, like if, if there are basically two divisions or two brigades uh, on each side, how their electronic warfare could be look like an example? Sure. So, so let's consider that you've got a, um, a target. You've got the red and you've got the red and the blue force, and the um, the red force is guarding a. Um, a fuel depot that the Blue Force wants to take control of and wants to capture. And the Blue Force have planned a specific maneuver in order to do that. And what they're going to do is they're going to have part of the Blue Force is going to perform a distracting move. So they're going to attack another objective with the hope of drawing some of the Red Force away. And then the second part of the Blue Force is going to go and try and capture the fuel depot. Then what they the Blue Force might do before that attack happens is firstly listen in to the communications of the Red Force. So what are they saying on the radio? Are there a lot of troops at the petrol depot, um, at the fuel depot rather? Are those troops tired? Uh, do they have enough fuel themselves? Do they have enough food? Have they had enough rest? Is their morale good? Um, is communications with the higher echelons good? Uh, do they have um, a good network of uh, reinforcements around them that they can bring into the battle if necessary. So what you're doing is you're eavesdropping on what they're saying in order to gather as much information as possible on their situation before you go and do this, um, this action. When you actually get round to doing the action, what you might do is you might use, um, you might do two things. You might, first of all, try and jam their communications. So these radio communications you've been listened to, you might try and transmit a huge amount of interference into their radios. So once the assault starts or before it, they can't communicate, they can't coordinate the force and they can't coordinate the response to um, what you're doing. Equally, you may leave some of their communications untouched because if you remember earlier, I said as part of this action, you're going to have a distracting action that's going to go on. Part of the Blue Force is going to go and attack another objective to try and draw off some of the Red Force. And so what you might do is leave some of their communications unjammed and put false traffic down and, or, or exaggerate the importance of this fake objective to yourselves or exaggerate the size of the force that's going to um, attack it, all these kind of things. So you can use the psychological element as well. You can bring in an information um, element, a psychological element to try and distract the Red Force. So in, in the land forces domain, that's sort of, if you like, at the tactical level, one way that you could use electronic warfare. So for me, um, I know a little bit about electronic warfare and one, one aspect that always comes up uh, is basically anti-radiation missiles. So that targets something that is sending out signals. Uh, how does EW prevent to be targeted by anti-radiation missiles or by or that they also get like by directed artillery fire? Because if you're sending out a lot, you're basically a Christmas tree, I think, on the on the battlefield, on the electromagnetic spectrum. So how do you prevent this? Do you have so many tree Christmas trees that you basically overjam the enemy? 
or you keep moving all the time or how do you prevent this? Well, there's, there's a huge amount of work that goes into keeping radar and radio signals as discreet as you possibly can. So back in the early days of, of radar and radio, the signals were very strong. Um, they were relatively easy to detect because the sheer amount of power the radar was transmitting. It's like a bright light, you know, a bright light, a bright light in a dark room is very easy to see. But over the years, um, a huge amount of engineering effort has gone into making radars and radios as discreet as possible. So using the bare minimum amount of power that you need to do whatever you're trying to achieve, be that to use a radar to detect an aircraft or use a radio to send a message from one radio to another. So you try and keep the signal very, very discreet. And ideally what you're trying to do is you have in electromagnetics, you have what's known as a noise floor. So this, this is the, um, the, the level of electromagnetic noise that is in the environment at the time. And you have permanent electromagnetic noise all across the world because you've got the noise of space. For instance, space is a very electromagnetically noisy place. You've got what's happening on Earth that's causing electromagnetic noise. So imagine it's like being in a very, very crowded um, uh, building, you know, with lots of people and there's a hubbub of noise. That's what the no noise floor is like. So what you're often trying to do is put your transmission as quiet, even below that, as quiet as possible. Um, so that it's very, very hard to detect. But then you can use other techniques as well, which are things like frequency hopping. So you, you're trying to change the frequency you're transmitting on probably several thousand times per second over a sort of pseudo-random sequence. And um, what that means is it becomes very hard to jam a transmission because even if you were able to, you find you know one part of a transmission for a thousandth of a second right okay we can jam that by the time you've done that the transmissions move to another frequency and on and on it goes it's like i don't know if you've ever seen in in this game they have called whack-a-mole i don't know if you know you, you know so so for your, for your viewers if they're not familiar with whack-a-mole basically what it is it's this this sort of big grid you have with all these holes and there's this this rubber mole that pop you've got a mallet haven't you or a hammer i think or something like this and the, the mole pops up in a pseudo random sequence and you're trying to hit the mole and maybe try and guess where it's going to be next it's really really hard to, to to hit the mole each time and that's how frequency hopping works so that you, you do a number of techniques to prevent yourself getting jammed or um or getting and if you're a radar getting an anti-radiation missile fired at you you want to try and be as subtle as possible what the u.s military do is they've actually got um when they deploy a radar, so for like their Patriot Air Defense System, they've got the radar and they have actually got decoys that they will put near the radar, which will look like the radar to an anti-radiation missile and probably be a bit more of a tempting target, you know, be a bit clearer, all of that kind of thing. So the, the idea is that the radar, the, the missile goes for that and not for the actual radar. But the safest thing to do on the battlefield is not to emit. And that's in, in the ideal world, you don't make any radio transmissions or any radar transmissions, but that's just not always possible. You know, you, you're gonna have to transmit at some time. You, you have to see what's out there, you have to share information. So you try and do that as discreetly as possible. And that's how you try and frustrate attempts to jam you or engage you with kinetic fire. But what do you do if you are actually jamming yourself because then you are lit up like a Christmas tree, I suppose. So how, how do you avoid getting hit if you are performing a jamming operation? Well, you're, you're absolutely right because you're, you know, the minute you jam, you're announcing where you are and what you're doing. So what you have to do is, is that's very, that's used judiciously and that's used very carefully. And that's why you'll, you'll notice if you look at things like US, electronic warfare doctrine, there's a very, very clear set of parameters and procedures about how you use jamming and how it is to be used and the sort of permiss permissions required to do that. Because once you, once you, as you say, you light up like a Christmas tree once you're jamming. So there's, there's procedures and there's techniques. I mean, one of the things that's been observed um, in uh, Ukraine 
and with the Russian operation there is that Russian jamming discipline has been has been quite questionable at times because one of the things we've seen the Russian army do is they do a huge amount of jamming so that they, they will absolutely go for it and they put a lot of noise out into the ether. But that causes two problems. Firstly, they often jam their own troops. So that's that, and that's that's caused a loss of life. I mean, that's been a case. There's been cases documented where you've got the forward line of troops and suddenly the jamming starts. And often what the Russians will do is they jam before they use artillery. So they'll, they'll do a huge amount of jamming first, then they'll bring the guns in. And you've had situations where the the line of the fall of shot is, 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 is too short. So they're hitting their own forward echelons. But because they're jamming, those forward echelons have no ability to radio back and say, look, you know, you're hitting us. Uh, you know, you, you, you need to move back uh, or move forward the line of jamming. And what you often see, I mean, in Western armies, for instance, is you, you'll have a list of things like taboo frequencies, which you can't jam. You know, which you're even if even if the enemy might be using them, you're relying on them as well. So you absolutely can't jam those. Or equally frequencies that the intel people want you to leave alone because they're getting a lot of nice information from it. So it's a calculated risk. Jamming is always a calculated risk. But like anything on the battlefield, you measure that risk against the it's a cost benefit analysis at the end of the day. So basically, you perform jamming when you when you know that the likelihood that you will be attacked or the enemy has anti radiation capabilities is rather low. Yeah, I think you you, you use jamming when the when the maneuver when the scheme of maneuver demands it or when the tactical situation does. I think that's the sort of general you know the general principle, I guess. So f another question is. How do you defend against EW? Particularly, can you de-jam? Is this at all possible? Like, because the enemy is jamming your, your phones and everything, is there any capability that you avoid this or, or, or defend against it? Or is it basically nothing works now and we have to switch to a different kind of communication system? So in terms of... I'm defending against electronic attack. Electronic warfare has three pillars to it, which is electronic attack, which is self-explanatory, electronic protection, which is protecting your own assets against electronic attack, and electronic support. And electronic support is, is the, if you like, the intelligence side of electronic warfare. So what is my adversary doing in the electromagnetic spectrum and how are they doing it? That's basically gathering that kind of information. There are things that you can do to nullify or at least to greatly reduce the effects that electronic warfare might have. And the first part of that approach is prevention. Um, so it, it's avoiding a situation where you are going to suffer adverse electronic attack, if at all possible. And the militaries do that, do that by using things like emissions control or MCON, as it's known. And, and that really is all about not using your radios and radars unless you absolutely have to. So keeping as discreet as possible. What you might also be doing is using techniques to prevent the discovery of your own systems. We talked a little bit earlier about the techniques like frequency hopping, like signals discretion, that kind of thing. So to try and prevent your signals being determined in the first place or discovered in the first place that's really important because if you if you don't discover the signal you can't jam it at the end of the day so you, you make a lot of efforts to do that but if the worst comes to worst and you do get jammed um, there are several steps that militaries will take to reduce the effectiveness of that jamming and what that may focus on is things like nullifying um, a particular set of frequencies so let's say you have a radar. I mean, it's very pure, sort of most simple um, definition or description. Let's say you've got a radar that transmits on frequencies of between 550 and 560 megahertz, so like a 10 megahertz bandwidth that your radar can use any frequency within those. And so you start, switch your radar on and you start transmitting on a... Um, a frequency of 552 megahertz and the enemy starts jamming that frequency well what you can do is move to another frequency 
So you can say, right, well, nothing's happening at 557 megahertz, so we'll transmit on that. Now, the enemy might well find out and jam that, so you move to another frequency. So as you can see, there's a cat and mouse game that's then going on in the spectrum to try and find the red force wants to use this frequency, the blue force doesn't want them to, and every time it discovers it's using that frequency, it jams it. So in its purest sense of the word, that's one of the things you can do. The other thing is it's possible sometimes to, to sort of geographically blank out the area where the jamming is happening. So, um, for instance, a lot of systems that are designed to preserve the use of the GPS system will, will be able to blank out a section of space, if you like, um, where jamming is occurring. So imagine you're driving in a Humvee and that Humvee's got a GPS system and you're driving parallel to where the front line is um, with the enemy. And you notice that, so the let's say the front line is um, to your north, the enemy is to your north, you're moving from west to east. And you notice that as you go along, you start having... GPS jamming, your GPS goes down, it's not working very well, it's problematic, you're getting the wrong position given to you, all of these kind of things. What your GPS system may be able to do is go, right, okay, I know that the bad guys are to the north of me. So any signal that looks like a GPS signal or has these characteristics that's going to come from that direction, I'm going to blank off. So I'm just going to ignore anything i'm not listening to anything that's coming from that direction so that's a way of sort of blanking out where the, ja the jamming is still coming it's still happening but what your gps receiver is doing is going okay i'm only going to take a gps gps fixes from satellites in that direction so i know that anything that is south of me is friendly and i trust signals coming from that direction but not from the north so that's another impact or that's another thing that you can do to reduce the impact of the jamming you you, you can't eliminate jamming in, entirely um, it, and it's always going to be a cat and mouse game in the spectrum it's always going to be you trying to outflank what your enemy is doing and also preempt it you know um, one of the things that you hear of is that sometimes you, you you know that okay you know we might start jamming these particular frequencies um, in VHF VHF very high frequency radio frequencies but if you you might have the electronic warfare folks who say, ah, yeah, but if we do that, there's a good chance that they may use ultra high frequency radio transmissions instead. So let's jam that as well. So we're going to preempt them even doing that. So once we start our VHF jamming, they change to a higher frequency, they're already going to find that's jammed. So there's a pre there's a preemptive aspect to it as well. But yeah, there are things you, that you can do. And it, it one of the nicest descriptions I've ever, or the, the, the most succinct descriptions um, ever I've heard of electronic warfare and how it actually is on the battlefield is that in short it is utter chaos what is going on much much like it is kinetically you know it is absolute chaos what is happening in the spectrum people are trying to use this frequency then it's getting jammed so they're moving here and all of these things are going on and of course it's all moving at the speed of light as well so there's a lot happening so thank you very much for your insights thank you Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.